Hey there, my name is AJ Pickett and I make videos about role playing games and lots of them. I upload twice a week with a live stream every weekend. You can also find me on Subscribestar, Patreon and Discord, Facebook and Twitter. Also, there is an option to join the channel as a member and I welcome any questions you have in the comment section down below. If you like this video or this channel, I welcome you to subscribe to this channel and its very friendly community. In today's video, we're going to start with a simple question and show how it has evolved into quite a complicated and very important key to understanding the looming fate of the entire Sword Coast of Faerun. In fact, the existence of the civilizations of this northwestern side of the continent are currently in great peril. I'll be relating lore here, but keep in mind this is all optional for your own Forgotten Realms campaign. It's just a resource and a source of inspiration for those of you who are thinking about your own world building. It starts with the question, in the frozen north, within and beyond the spine of the world mountains, in ancient caves and long lost captured dwarven holds, what is it that all the grey orcs survive on? How do they manage to not only live in these harsh environments, but thrive, reaching a point in only a few generations where their population has grown beyond their means to sustain themselves? Is it starvation that drives them to raid the southern lands, or is it something else? There are elk, mountain goats, rabbits, wolverines, or Vorax, behir, cave bears. But for the most part, the staple diet of the grey orcs of the spine of the world mountains and somewhat beyond has been a naturally occurring and now widely propagated cave fungus called ripple bark. Ripple bark is a type of fungus called a bracket or shelf fungus found growing in striations or parallel horizontal ridges on rock walls. It's called arantim by the dwarves and grows wherever there is a little moisture. It has a slightly fuzzy texture with deep cracks in the soft woody flesh and the coloration is generously described as mottled brown but more often said to look like rotten flesh. An extremely hardy organism, as long as there is a bit of water to soak up from the air or rock surfaces, ripple bark will grow in the coldest caverns or positively thrive in the volcanically heated tunnels, often found deep in the heart of mountain ranges or all the way down to the lower reaches of the underdark. It does look quite suspect, but actually is one of the more safe and edible fungus types to be found. It has a bland, nutty flavour that is improved with some roasting over heat. Even ripple bark that has been scorched black over a fire is still edible. Mature ripple bark is harvested when the shelf of fleshy fungus reaches about the size of a large dinner plate, yielding about 7 to 10 pounds or 3.2 to 4.5 kilograms of food. Ripple bark doesn't require light to grow, but if sunlight is available, it will grow much faster. Same with additional sources of nutrients. They will thrive on wood, living or dead, and other fungus and such, but can grow on nothing much more than nutrients pulled from humid air and mists. When exposed to extreme cold or in totally dry conditions for extended periods of time, they'll go into a dormant state and can survive like that for an astonishing eight years before it either gets some moisture and nutrients or dies off. It can slip in and out of this dormant state over and over again depending on the conditions. As a fungus, ripple bark releases spores of course. They are quite harmless to humanoids. They can be eaten, breathed in, carried on or inside the body for many miles before dusting some good spot to start growing. Ripple bark does consume living or dead wood, plant material and airborne nutrients, but it poses no threat to warforged, whose woody fibre muscles are protected by their alchemical version of body fluids which transform the wood into something quite different to what it appears. On that subject, wood in the underdark can be surface lumber, laboriously transported down at great effort and risk, but there is a species called Luridin, also known as blood fruit, that only grows in areas rich in the fickle flows of phaseress energy. Unique to the subterranean world within the planet Tyrell, there are also the huge barrel stalk mushrooms that are felled and milled into planks and such, much like surface trees. Fungus forests of the Underdark have their own dangers, predators, pitfalls and pests. Underdark lumberjacks are one hell of a tough breed. Ripple bark is the staple food of grey orcs. It provides them with a clean supply of water, as fungus mycelium is composed of about 85 to 90% water by total weight. And the ripple bark is most likely a type of symbiotic organism, which has both fungus and algae. The algae being unique to Toril and adapted to use the phase rest energy to form soluble sugars and the more complex carbohydrates. This makes the fungus a much more complete food source very rich in minerals and able to synthesize carbohydrates directly from inorganic materials. Orcs grow fast and have a pretty intense metabolism, which the ripple bark sustains very well. 
It may not be fancy, but it sure is satisfactory, and orc culinary skills are not exactly refined, so something that can be eaten raw or just roasted over a fire really suits them quite well. Now given that this is such an abundant food source, it begs the question, is it really starvation that drives the grey orc population to gather in massive numbers to raid the southern lands? And before you think the nice warm southern lands with all their rich farmlands, I remind you that the Underdark is mostly very warm and doesn't suffer the extremes of weather the surface world does, plus it's full of fungus and animals that thrive on it. No, it's social, cultural factors that drive this behaviour. In order for a young orc warrior to gain social standing, they need combat experience. So you have lots of young orcs just itching for combat, in prime physical condition, and all these older orc veterans who are wise enough to see the need to redirect this aggression away from them, and towards the soft and pampered humanoids of the southern surface world. It's really not that complicated. Orc tribes grow large, and they fight amongst themselves until they start to consolidate into combined tribes, which follow a charismatic leader and they maintain and grow their social standing by attracting more and more warbands until they have turned into a massive horde. And then next thing you know, they're rampaging across the south, wiping out towns and settlements, laying siege to cities, and so on. What they're not doing is raiding livestock and granaries and transporting all that food back to their northern orc holds. They don't need to. Okay, so this cycle of growth and violence has been going on ever since the orcs have been on Toril arriving long ago from the worlds called Adzadar, Kaelindir, Hunthir, Saathir, and also from the world of Greyhawk. Shout out to Eric Boyd, a sage among sages, for this information. Surviving attempted genocide by the armed forces of the Netheril Empire, and the mass predation of some very formidable dragons. And it's one particular very secretive dragon that we are now going to focus all of our attention on. I'm going to now read directly from an article by Ed Greenwood and Sean K. Reynolds, derived from an original Dragon Magazine text thanks to help from Nick Tompkins and Stephen Domkowski and published in Dragon Magazine 259 as part of the Worms of the North series, attributed to the journals of Volothamp Gedarm, hosted online as of 2004. Link to the source is in the description for this video. And I quote, Few have heard of Zunde Razalim, but this worm of the north should be famous, or infamous, from one end of Toril to the other. She is not, however, a seeker of publicity. This ancient steel dragon, called by some multiversal travellers a greyhawk dragon, but known by many on Toril as the Waterdeep dragons, has been hiding in human form for years in the city of Neverwinter. She has taken her true shape only to fight off a raiding mage of the Brotherhood of the Arcane, Erlendin Shadow Talons Mardalere, whom she tore apart over the Sea of Swords in 1364 of the Dale Reckoning calendar, and to devour a pair of wyverns who some 40 years earlier made the fatal mistake of deciding to lair in the southernmost part of the Crags Mountains. Steel dragons in their draconic form, as I've described in a video on this channel about them, are especially feline in their movements and stature. They have scales that shine like burnished steel as adults, and usually smell like wet metal. Younger steel dragons' scales are darker blue-grey and less lustrous. Steel dragons' wings are made up of overlapping blades that look more like feathers, and the scales on their chests resemble shields, and they have long spines surrounding their faces which give the appearance of hair, and their faces are particularly expressive, almost human-like in many ways, but still very much draconic. In humanoid forms, steel dragons usually keep their true identities very secret. However, they always have at least one visual clue as to their true nature in the form of some steel grey feature, be it hair, eyes, clothing, or some such. Zundar Azalim's human identity is a Mundra Nealedra, a plump, gossipy, happy laundress and seamstress who makes stylish everyday gowns and cloaks for the citizens of Neverwinter. She also repairs and cleans all the exotic costumes and flashy garb worn at the Moonstone Mask, the most famous inn, restaurant and fest hall in the city of skilled hands. Nilaedra is pudgy, stooping and going grey in attractive streaks, but Zunda Razalin does spend occasional nights in more attractive human guises, shapeshifting into the exact likeness of one of the female employees of the mask who is off sick on or on leave for the evening at the Moonstone Mask. The owner of the mask, the sorceress Ophala Chelderstorn, has led her staff to believe that her own spells transform a skilled but aging courtesan to take their places. Ophala and Zunda Razalin are firm friends, and the sorceress knows Amundra Nilaedra's true nature. 
Ophala aids the Steel Dragon from time to time with her spells, and she keeps Zundir Aslan's hoard magically hidden in an undisclosed place. It's not buried underground, or in the mask, or in Neliadra's Brightweave's laundry. Zundir Aslan often helps out Ophala in return, more than once the laughing laundress of Neverwinter has smuggled prominent guests out of the mask in her gigantic baskets of laundry, enabling them to avoid embarrassing confrontations with rivals, murderous foes, spouses, superiors or admirers. She has also, on several memorable nights, flown important agents and members of the Lord's Alliance out of Neverwinter on her back when they needed to be elsewhere in a hurry. Zinder Aslan claims no domain, but she considers Neverwinter her territory. She defends it against other dragons who dare to reveal themselves openly and aggressively in or above the streets, or tries to dominate its folk rather than dwelling among them as she does. Battle so excites her that she chortles and hoots almost constantly during combat, hence her nickname, the Laughing Worm. So far, no one has connected the Laughing Laundress with the Laughing Worm, but then there's no reason they should, and Wundra Neladra doesn't behave proudly, or as if she has secrets apart from the latest juicy gossip. Zundir Aslan likes adventurers, though she's very wary of large mercenary companies and secretive organisations, is wary of unfamiliar wizards, and dislikes blusterers and tyrants, whether they be children lording it over their fellows in alleyways, or kings who mistreat their subjects or try to conquer new territory. She often seeks out drunken, brawling or bullying sailors who have come to port, Luskanites are habitual offenders, or haughty or overly cruel visiting adventurer mages, and teaches them a lesson. She usually lures them into private places by posing as a flirtatious tavern wench, then changes to dragon form with clashing jaws and wild laughter. Usually, Zunda Azalim lets those she has terrified flee unscathed, but she's been known to tear a mage's staff, cloak and garments away to remove his magic, or break a sailor's sword arm and the sword with it. Zunda Azalim may seem to do no more than take the usual whimsical interest in humans that any steel dragon gone human does, but she has more secret schemes and hushed achievements than most dragons can imagine. Zundra Aslam follows a bright dream of her own. She wants dragonkind to live in harmony with humanoids, perhaps as the champions and defenders of realms peopled and governed, as she puts it, the teeming so-called civilized races. This, she believes, would result in happier, better lives for all. To accomplish this, worms have to see themselves as guardians of a common treasure, not their own hordes. The most cruel, violent and greedy dragons must be slain, and all the dragons must find food that is not the creatures they hope to dwell with, or great numbers of these same creatures' livestock. So dragons will always feel the need to hunt, but hunger mustn't force them to eat their allies, friends or fellow citizens. The Dreaming Worm, as her agents the Soft Claws call her, just to confuse things, they also refer to her as the Never Worm, is quick to say dreamers are dangerous, but she's become that most deadly force for change a being who energetically tries to make their dreams become real. She set about trying to protect civilization in the Sword Coast North and create that alternate food source that she deems necessary for dragonkind. Zundra Aslam sees two great dangers to the North, the harsh climate and the Orc hordes. The first must be endured. Magical attempts to meddle with the weather, in her opinion, only lead to disasters. But the Dreaming Worm believes she can do something about the Orc problem and their periodic and very destructive hordes. What if the most evil, hungry, and aggressive dragons held lairs in the path of the emerging orc hordes, so that the one would be forced to fight the other? Somehow such dragons must be manipulated into relocating their lairs in the right places. Zundar Aslam tries to do this through her agents, the Soft Claws, with carefully planted legends and rumours about lost dragon hordes and vacant dragon lairs that slowly confer magical powers to worms who dwell in them. Ah. I'm thinking about the magical healing well that attracted the great red worm Cloth to just such a location and his tremendous impact on the orc population. To gain materials for her immersion projects, to keep watch on orc populations and to gather information on the whereabouts and deeds of dragons throughout the western Thayrun, Zundar Aslan needs a band of capable but nondescript undercover agents. She began recruiting such from the ranks of local traders, woodcarvers, and failed adventurers some 40 years ago, and the dedicated folk she is pleased to call her Soft Claws now number over 60 humans, elves, halflings, and half-elves. These agents operate as far east as Suzale and as far south as Baldur's Gate. 
The Laughing Worm suspects there are also agents of the Harpers and the Heralds in the Soft Claws, but she worries more about infiltration by the Cult of the Dragon, the Arcane Brotherhood, or mages bent on gaining power over dragons. This concern has deepened in recent years since more than one of her agents has gone missing, and their magical Never Tokens with them. Never Tokens are specially enchanted badges carried by all Soft Claws, given to them by Zundaraslan. She has a cache of identical items. For the entire cache of Halruin family trading tokens was given over to her in 1320 DR by Ensible Mratavalan, the dying last member of that family. All of Zundaraslan's Never Tokens appear as identical, glossy smooth, silvery blue, four-pointed metal stars. Each is one inch thick and about four inches across from point to point. They're lighter than their volume suggests, pierced in the center to allow a neck chain or keep strap to be passed through them, and their points and edges are rolled and blunt. They are constructed of an unknown alloy that is extremely durable and resistant to damage. In fact, it's hard to make a mark on Never Tokens with anything short of a forge hammer, and when broken, a token typically bursts into a harmless flaring flame and falls to dust in seconds. All Never Tokens are protected from corrosion, and all emit a pleasant four-tone metallic chord, like a quartet of bells when struck, a property difficult to fake without careful spell work. Never Tokens constantly function as a glove of storing, a ring of feather falling, and a ring of mind shielding. All other Never Token powers function when the item is grasped with bare flesh and a power is willed into action. Handling a token doesn't yield a hint of its abilities. Zundra Aslam instructs her agents in the token's powers, yielding information about the strongest abilities only when she trusts a particular soft claw. They can be used to cast Sending, teleport and to indicate the direction of the nearest other never token. The soft claws have many duties beyond spying and fetching. They try to relocate active dragons by improving or even creating lair caverns in desired locales, particularly remote northern mountains perilously close to orc colonies, daringly planting maps usually in the backpacks of recovered treasure near known dragon lairs, or even posing as adventurers and using far-hailing spells to talk to one another about rich dragon lairs they're heading for, so that a dragon in its lair accidentally overhears them. They also plant rumours in the ranks of the Cult of the Dragon to manipulate the activities of that evil organisation. Some prominent members of the Northern Society are members of the Soft Claws, and they use the Moonstone Mask as their primary covert rallying place, and regard the Laughing Worm as a kindly mother. This is fitting when one considers that she nurses them back to health, occasionally comes to winging to their rescue, arranges careers for them, and dispenses advice as well as unofficial salaries. These payments come regularly, but often, and Zinder Aslam is never short of money thanks to her trading acumen. The efforts of the Claws on her behalf, and the legacy left to her by the last of the Mratavalans from Halrua, whom she rescued from family foes and guarded for the last three decades of his life, She's always had time to sit with her agents and discuss their own dreams and their goals. In her search for a lasting replacement food source for dragons, Zundra Aslam seized on Ripplebark and for many years tried to modify it or augment it, and at length she hit upon a still secret mixture in which she soaks Ripplebark fragments for a month to create what she calls Long Bite, formerly the substance known as Rothduin which is a word concocted from elven, dwarven, and draconic roots combining to mean something akin to improved to achieve satiation, or bettered to be satisfying. <laughs> Her process renders the Ripplebark able to sustain all but the most terribly wounded or most active dragons for months on a small meal. Most active includes those rare dragons who spend a third of their time fighting or hunting, Small, in this case, means a volume of long bite roughly equivalent to the bodies of three average-sized humans. Zundraslim's mixture, an iridescent syrup, is known to be predominantly water and include an elixir of vitality, a magical draught that removes fatigue, exhaustion, poison and disease and sustains the drinker without food and water for seven days. Dissolved air spores, a magical item that grants 2d4 days of breathable air regardless of the surrounding environment, and the sap of oak or ash trees, dissolved pearls, and at least a dozen other ingredients, many of which are powdered. Softclaw agents believe that the ground bones of some creature are one of these, and have learned to their cost that the mixture is poisonous if drunk, even sipped sparingly by elves, half-elves, or humans. 
The Laughing Worm keeps her agents so busy retrieving large varieties of strange substances for her, some of which are undoubtedly continuing experiments aimed at creating a successful soft scale soak, another one of her creations, such as pumice, pine nuts, chicken livers, lamb kidneys and bulrushes, that no one has been able to set down a definitive ingredient list for long bite out of the plethora of things that they gather for her. Zinder Aslan is even known to have made large profits by cornering the market on particular goods, then reselling them in bulk when shortages occur. Some of her acquisitions, many of them stored in hidden caverns under Neverwinter Woods and garrisoned by the soft claws, may not be for alchemical purposes at all. Now, not so different in appearance from the current incarnation of the iridescent long bite mixture, the soft scale soak is an experimental healing and restorative bath for dragons. It is intended to keep their scales supple, their senses keen, and otherwise slow the physical side effects of age, allowing the complete regeneration of sorely wounded dragons. Ingredients of the current soak, which is thought to have accomplished Zindraslam's first and lesser healing aim, are known to include the discarded shells of hatched dragon eggs, as well as dissolved dragon bones and scales, though just what was used to dissolve them, the Laughing Worm keeps a deadly secret. At least once, Zinder Aslam has plunged into the heart of an orc horde in the mountain vales and deliberately lingered in battle until badly wounded. She was then snatched back to a disused quarry near Conneberry by the spells of her sorceress friend Ophala and lowered into a bath of her own preparation. Most of these soaks failed to do more than soothe her, but the Laughing Worm still believes a successful sovereign healing bath for dragons is possible, if she just hit upon the right formula for it. The ambitious dreams pursued by the Laughing Worm, along with her spying on nearby dragons, seem likely to lead her into disaster. Most evil dragons will slay or capture her to gain her long bite secrets, if they learn of them. And for Zinder Aslam's schemes to come to fruition, she must sooner or later reveal Longbite to all dragons. Even if this is somehow accomplished so quickly and widely that one dragon can't gain an advantage over another, the Laughing Worm and her comparatively puny force of soft claws will still be faced with the problem of a dragon, or the cult of the dragon in the face of the crushing blow to their influence over dragons, moving enthusiastically to try to control most of the easily reached ripple bark. Even hints of a partially successful soft scale soak would spell the same peril for Zinder Aslam. The soft claws know they are in for a dangerous ride in the years ahead, and more than one of them knows what Zinder Aslam only suspects. Certain harpers, and probably some of the chosen, know of the Laughing Worm's activities. They might at any time choose to act against her, or sweep in to seize what she has crafted. Zinder Aslam knows of the increasing danger and seems to sense her remaining time might be short. With increasing daring, she is seeking out passing adventurers to carry her secrets to other places and custodians of lore. Notably, <laughs> Candlekeep. Her gamble is a long shot indeed, but if she succeeds, however, Faerun will be forever changed, and that's more than many tyrants or gods can accomplish. Please hit the like button if you made it this far, subscribe if you like what I do, check out my Subscribestar or Patreon links for all the full scripts for these videos, Buy some Teespring merchandise, wear your geek with pride. And as always, thanks for listening, and I'll be back with more for you very soon.